What are they going to sing, Kay? Well, I better be figuring it out. The Duck Dynasty theme song, I'm afraid. We don't want that tonight. What do we need? Oh, that ain't it. Come on up here, Buzz. You know you're supposed to be in this group. All right. They need you to help them on this one. Amen. All right. Who's, who's got the first verse here? Now listen, if they're not here on Wednesday night, they're missing a lot. They're learning. It's more important than you would believe. They have a great time. Get your kids in that Wednesday night Bible class. They're, in, they're learning the Word of God. Amen. Their attention span's not quite as long as an adult. Theirs is about only about 15 minutes, and the adult's about 20. Uh, but uh, they, they, they're learning the Word of God. Amen. All right. Y'all got a song for us, Kristen? Yeah. Come on, sing one tonight. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. Amen. Sure is good to have Brother Wayne with us this weekend. He staying uh, one more day, I think. And uh, sure has been a blessing to have him up from Florida, Miss B. And uh, I, Jim, Brother Jim, them was here this morning. They're on some of his kinfolk church over in Lenore. So uh, y'all pray for them. They'll be headed back down to Florida. And uh, I know I know that uh, there's a spark plug in there this morning, boy, I tell you. And Brother Eubanks, listen, that guy, that missionary that's here this morning, he's a unique fella. The man flew over the Vatican in Rome and dropped out thousands of tracks. He's the only person I ever know that's got away with anything like that. I don't see how. It's the truth. He really did it. And, uh, I mean, can you imagine them priests and cardinals and bishops and them? All of a sudden it starts raining down the gospel tracks from heaven. Uh, but uh, he sure did. But uh, I'll tell you, his character, 
And he, he believes in witnessing. And that's, that's a blessing. But anyway, y'all go ahead.
singing. All right, let's get our Bibles open now. We've had a lot of singing tonight. Let's get in the Word of God. Just a few minutes before you leave, I uh, want to bring you a thought that everybody here needs to nail down this evening, and that is how you can know that you're really saved. How do you know that you're really saved? You'd be surprised, people, that go to church every Sunday who have serious, major doubts of where they would go if they died tonight, and you are going to die. Nobody, you ain't going to get out of here alive unless the rapture comes. You're going to die. Something's going to take you out. I tell people that all the time. They look at me like, how could you possibly say that? They ought to teach it in high school. They ought to teach it in junior high. They ought to teach it in college. Death 101. You are going to die. You can't stop it. You can uh, you can prolong it, put it off for a little while, but you will not get out of dying. The death rate is 100%. Don't matter how much you exercise, how much money you got. Old Magic Johnson got diagnosed with HIV back about 1991. He's still alive and seems to be doing fine. But you just watch. Something will get him. If that don't, something else will. So the question is, are you really saved? First John chapter 3. First John chapter 3 tonight. And let's look at a verse of scripture here this evening. And then, uh, then you can go get your ice cream. It's still hot weather. And we got... Another week or two of summer left, and it'll be uh, fall. And um, boy, it's been starting to feel like it at night, hasn't it? Uh, but let's uh, let's uh, get here in the Word of God. Just a minute tonight. Won't take but just real real briefly. I'm just going to name y'all three or four little things. First John chapter three and verse number two. Beloved, look at this. Now are we the sons of God? Right now. Stop there. Right now. We are not waiting to become a child of God. We are, present tense, a child of God. We are not waiting to die to see if we will be get, to get to be one. We already are one now. Amen. That's enough to shout about right there. You are a son of God right now. And it doth not yet appear what we shall be. But we what? No, look at it, but we what? No, that when he shall appear, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. How, there are several ways you can know you're saved. You can, you can be saved and know it. My pastor taught us that the two greatest things in life are, number one, be saved and know it. Number two, be in the will of God. Number Uh, 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 I want to say the two greatest things in life are, number one, be saved and know it. Number two, be in the will of God and know it. Now, I know I'm saved. 
You say, no, you just think you are. No, I know I'm saved, and I'm going to tell you why I'm not. And I, as far as I know, I'm in the will of God for my life. I'm not perfect. I, I mess up every day of my life, but I believe that I'm in God's will. I believe it's God's will for me to be a preacher. I believe it's God's will for me to be a preacher at Shining Up Baptist Church. I believe it's His will for me to try. If, if I ain't in His will, I sure don't know what it is. Uh, but I hope you know that too. I hope you're in the will of God. One lady told me, she said one night, she said, well, I married the wrong man, and it was not God's will. Now, listen, you might have married the wrong man, but as soon as you're married, he is the right man. You get that? You understand that? You might have married the wrong woman, but after you're married, she becomes the right woman. All right, because God wants you to be together. And say, yes, yeah. man told me one time, he said, well, we got married and fussed and fussed, and us, we decided it wasn't God's will. If you were married, it's God's will. It's God's will. But you know, you know what God's will is? For you to do right where you are right now. That's God's will. You're doing the right thing right now. Now, yeah, it's not a complicated thing. And you say, well, I just don't know what God's will is. Well, if, if he wants you to do something, he'll show you. If he don't, he won't. So don't worry about it. Just keep doing what you're doing. Now, there's a lot of preachers running around trying to talk people out of their salvation. And I'm not going to do that. I know preachers that go around and preach revivals, trying their best to convince half the church members they're not saved so they can go tell a bunch of people, bunch of people got saved. And that ain't right. I'm not up here trying not trying to talk you out of it. I ain't trying to talk you into it if you ain't got it, neither. I'm trying to help you nail it down and be sure of it. Be sure of it. I heard a man say one time, he said, 75% of our church members are lost. I don't believe that a bit more uh, in the world. Now, there might be in some big dead liberal churches 75% lost. Well, I won't argue with that. But surely to the Lord, 75% of us ain't lost. I don't believe that. I believe uh, the big majority of people here in our church are saved and know the Lord. You know the right spirit. And you know what we had in here this morning. I mean, you know that's real. You know that's right. The spirit that's in you. And I'll talk about that more in just a minute. But quickly tonight, let me just give you some simple little ways that you know that you're saved. Number one, when you're saved, you have a love for God down in your heart. You have a love for God down in your heart. The Bible says the love of God is shed abroad in our heart. The Bible said if any man love God, it is known of him. Now, uh, you need to love God. And you, David said, my heart panteth after God. Uh, if you love him, you love him tonight. The night I got saved, I had a love for the Lord. I knew there was a God before I got saved. I knew he was up there somewhere. I remember praying in, in high school back in them days. We'd play at, pray at ball games. All the guys would go around and put their hands on the ball. And somebody would leave and say, Our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. I know he's up there somewhere. Maybe he'll help us. I don't know. Uh, uh, maybe, but I didn't know him. I didn't love him. But the night I got saved, there immediately became a love for God in my heart. I didn't put it there. I didn't decide to start loving him. I, there was just something in me that loved him. You say, well, how do I know if I love him, preacher? Well, if you love somebody, you don't want to mistreat them. If you love somebody, you don't want to misrepresent them. If you love somebody, uh, you, you like to spend time with them. If you love somebody, you don't mind spending money on them. I, I remember when I got saved... They took me to Asheville. Somebody took me to Asheville. They said, Danny, there's a Christian bookstore in Asheville. I didn't know what a Christian bookstore was. I had no idea there was such a thing. There wasn't none in Marion. And uh, we started the first one's ever been in Marion. It's still there. And, uh, but there never was one in Marion. And uh, we went to Asheville. They took me in there. I walked in there. And there was books about the Lord. And a whole shelf full of Bibles. And tracts. And commentaries. And Pennants and book markers, and I went, Lord, have mercy. You mean everything in here is Christian? They said, it's a Christian bookstore. I went, wow, I want to buy everything in there. I went, you know what? I didn't want that before I got saved. When I got saved and they took me in that Christian bookstore, I said, I like this place. I like, there was something happened. I know I'm saved because I had a love for the Lord and stuff that had things, like, I love to, to be around the things of the Lord. I wanted to be on His side. I wanted to be on the Lord's side. You know, I remember one time when I, before I got saved, I was coming home from a ball game and I was with these older guys. I was about 14. 
And I remember these guys, they were 17 and 18, and they was taking me home. And somehow or another, I never remember this coming up before I got saved, but just one time, they was taking me home up Hoppy Tom Holler, my road. And we was going up through there, and some of them said something about God. And this one guy, he was real smart and educated, he thought. He's about 20, I guess. And he turned around, and he said, Oh, they ain't no God like that. And I'd never heard nobody say that. But I'm telling you, my mom showed me there was a God when I was little. And she told me, and I knew my mom wouldn't lie to me. I knew there was a God. And I was in the back seat, and it scared me to death. And I spoke up and said, well, I believe there is one. That's all I said. And I thought, I spoke up for him. I didn't even know him. I didn't even know who God was, but I I knew he was there somewhere. And buddy, listen, as a lost person, lost without God, knowing that, you know what happened when I got saved? I really wanted to speak up for him. I matter of fact, that's what I do all the time now. I, you know where you love God? You take his side in a controversy. When something comes up at work, you're on the Lord's side. Say amen right there. When them people at work start talking about partying this weekend and they start talking about we're going to a club this weekend, you know what? If you love God, you want to take the Lord's side. He was like, you know, I was like, well, hey, why don't y'all go to church with me? <laughs> uh, why don't y'all go? I mean, brother, let them have it. You know how you're saved? Because there's a love for God down in your heart. Number two, you know how you know you're saved? Because you have a love for God's Word. You love the Bible. You suddenly want to hear the Bible. The Bible said, if any man will do his will, he'll keep my word. If you keep his word, you know him. He, he is his word. He's his word. I mean, brother, I mean, I mean, you just want to know his word. You want to hear the word. You have a hunger for the word. Just like a baby wants milk, a new Christian wants to hear the word of God. If a baby don't want milk, there's something wrong with it. If a baby don't, if you got a little baby back there, and I say, well, is it anything to eat today? No. Does it drink milk? No, it'll die, brother. It'll die. There's something wrong with a baby that don't want no milk. And there's something wrong with somebody that says I'm saved and has absolutely no desire for any Bible whatsoever. I'll never forget, Brother Wayne, when I first got saved, I remember uh, when I was growing up, uh, Mom would have Billy Graham on. And once in a while, there'd be a Billy Graham crusade on. Back then, we didn't have 24-hour-a-day Christian television like we have now. You couldn't turn it on here preaching 24 hours a day. But once in a while, Billy Graham would have a crusade. And they'd show it every night for a week. And people would talk about it. And I remember sitting there, and I remember him, him saying, I, 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 I remember it didn't do nothing to me. I remember seeing him on there, and I thought, well, I guess he's all right. I, I, but it did nothing for me, absolutely nothing. I remember coming in, Billy Graham's on. Oh, let's go outside and play. Mom's watching Billy Graham. Preaching's on TV. I remember every Sunday morning when I was little, the, uh, when I would wake up on Sunday morning, it wasn't like it is on now. They had gospel singing and preaching on till 12 o'clock. And then at 12 o'clock, they'd have, uh, you know, regular shows and the news and football games or whatever was on. But they had a gospel. And, uh, they, and I'm, every Sunday morning, uh, I, I would wake up and I, Mom would have a TV on. And I could hear him in there and they'd say, Jubilee, Jubilee, you're invited to this happy Jubilee. Jubilee, Jubilee, come and join our happy Jubilee. And I went, oh. The sorriest music I've ever heard in my life. I mean, I listened to rock music and I thought, Lord have mercy, Mom, how can you stand that? And, and Mom would sing, you know, go through the house singing. Them. It done nothing to me. But I'm going to tell you something. The night I got saved, every bit of that changed. The night I, I mean, immediately it changed. I went to my cousin's house after I'd been saved a few days and Billy Graham, well, Billy Graham was on TV and I remember saying, hush, y'all, hush, hush. And I sat down and said, I want to hear it. I want to listen to him. I want to hear him. And I thought, I didn't used to want to hear him. I, I didn't have nothing against Billy Graham. I didn't talk bad about Billy Graham. But I had no desire. There was something in me that wanted to hear the Bible. And I remember telling him, I said, y'all hush for him. I want to listen to the man. I remember going up town and marrying. There's some guys preaching on the courthouse lawn. And I remember saying, I remember crossing the street saying, I want to hear this. I want to hear. If I rode down the road and seen a tent meeting, I'd pull in and roll down the window. I'd say, I want to hear what they're preaching in there. I want to hear it. Ladies and gentlemen, I know I got saved because I started wanting to know what was in that book. 
Whatever was in me, put a hunger in there like a baby wants milk. A Christian wants to hear the Word of God. Something wrong with you if you don't have no appetite for the Bible. I ain't saying you're not saved. I'm not your judge. I'm just saying something ain't right. Amen. People in other countries have little pieces of the Bible about that big. And they'll have about four verses on it. And that's all they've got. And I mean, them Christians in Sudan and them Christians in Russia and in communist China, they'd have a little piece of the Bible about like that right there. And it'd have about three verses on it. It'd say, For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son. That was their Bible reading every day. And they'd hold on to that little piece like a page out of the Bible or less than a page. And some of you've got Bibles laying all over your house. You've got three or four at home and never crack one open. You know what you need? You need to get off the devil's candy and get your hunger back for the the Word of God. You know why kids don't want to eat what's good for them? You know why kids won't eat their vegetables and meat? Because they've been eating candy and popsicles and ice cream and candy bars all day and have no appetite for what's good for them. You know what your problem is? Uh, you've been feeding yourself on TV. You've been listening to that rock music, rap music, dirty music, country music, all that, and it killed your appetite for the meat of the Word of God. Now, I'm telling you tonight, you know you're saved because you've got an appetite for the Bible. Number three, you know how you know you're saved? You know how you know you're saved? You have a love for the brethren. You suddenly start liking Christian people. I remember going to church a time or two before I got saved, and I thought, ooh, boy, these are the ugliest, crankiest looking old bunch of people I've ever seen in my life. I hope people, I hope kids don't think that when they come in here. I remember thinking every Christian was at least. 80. You had to be at least 80 to be a Christian. And then you had to have a sour look on your face. Your lip had to be hanging that far down and you could never smile. That's why I mean, I heard this guy teaching Sunday school. That's why I tell our Sunday school teachers, work hard, make it interesting, make it fun, make it exciting. I, I went to Sunday school and you know what? Some of them little churches, they'd put us down in a little basement room somewhere that smelt moldy. Uh, you Sunday school teacher, make your class smell good. I mean, get in there and work. Paint it, make it pretty and bright and colorful. I, we'd go down in a little basement and there'd be cobwebs and mold and it'd stink. Had that smell and a guy got up there and he'd say, Overcoming the heartaches of life. Here, here, good to see boys and girls. We must learn how. And that's what he did for 30 minutes. I went, Lord, have mercy. I mean, I'm telling you what I thought, Lord. I, I tell you, but you know what? After I got saved, when I got saved, it looked completely different. When I got saved, it looked, uh, some of those older folks I started liking. I was 18 and wanted to hang around my pastor, and he was 100. He was really only 40 something, and I thought he was 100. I, I mean, you, we forget how kids look at us sometimes. Amen. Lord, they look at us like we're from the, uh, went around with dinosaur days and stuff. We, we forget how kids see us. Listen, you better, when, you know, when, when kids come in here on Sunday morning and they come in and you just look at them like, like that right there, you're not making a very good impression on them. I mean, you have had them on the head say, how you doing there, fella? Good to see you. The Lord loves you. I sure am glad you're here today. I mean, if they'd have done that to me, it might have made a big difference in my life. Ladies and gentlemen, I had a love for the brethren. We wanted to go around and preach. We went with a preacher to revival. My pastor's preaching revival up here on the mountain somewhere. And a bunch of we loaded up in the car with the preacher who was 100 years old and went to revival with him. And I said, buddy, I must have got saved. I must have got saved because I would have never. I, would, I wouldn't even go to church on Sunday morning, let alone on a night. On a weeknight or a Friday, on Friday night going to church, that's out of the question. That's totally ridiculous. Friday night, are you crazy? That's when you go to the movies. That's when you go there. We aren't going to go to church on. We wanted to go to revival with the preacher who was a hundred on Friday night. Listen, I thought, I'm bound to God saved. I want to be around God's people. One way you know you've got it is you enjoy being around the people of God. Amen. You get a love for the brethren. Now, there's two things you're going to learn in your Christian life. I'm going to give you a couple more things. I'll be done. Number one, are you listening? You learn these two lessons and get them down quick. Number one, the people that's closest to you is the one that's going to hurt you the most. And that's why it's true. All of life is like that. 
You get hurt more by the people that love. You know why? Because you love so deep. People that don't, the people that you don't care about so say something bad about you, something like that. It, 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 it might hurt for a minute, it goes away. But the people that closest to you, who's going to hurt you? Don't ever forget that. You're going to get hurt in church. You're going to get your feelings hurt. You're going to feel, you're going to feel like sometimes they will just walk right by you. You're going to feel like, like we got these deacons. We got these deacons coming up next Sunday night. We're going to ordain these three deacons. I wouldn't doubt a bit. They ain't some men sitting in here tonight saying, well, how come, how come I'm not? Look, look, can I say something to you? If you want to be a deacon and you believe the Lord wants you, you come and tell me, brother. We'll pray about it. We'll make you one. Don't sit there and let the devil tell you, well, they don't appreciate me and nobody loves me because they didn't ask me. You're listening to the devil. And I didn't even know I was going to say that. It just popped out. Maybe somebody thought that. Uh, but uh, listen, don't do that. Say, well, nobody ever asked me to be a Sunday school teacher. Nobody ever. I, listen, don't, don't be like that. You get your feelings hurt in church. So I get my feelings hurt. Almost every Sunday. They're hurt right now. You say, why? Because the people ain't here at all to be here. And it bothers me. It hurts me. You know what? I'm not going to whine and pout because the ones that ain't here, I'm going to shout because of all y'all that are here. There's a whole lot more it is here than what ain't. And I'm going to tell you tonight, you're going to get hurt by those you love. And then there's another thing you better learn, and that is the closer you get to God, the closer you get to the devil. I heard a preacher say that one time, and I, it, it didn't make no sense. I thought the closer you got to God, the further you got to the devil. That ain't true. You know where the devil is? He's right up there beside God. And he's right up there beside the throne. And the closer you get to the Lord, the closer you get to the devil because he's right here beside God's throne trying to mess things up. The more you get right, the more... I've had people tell me all over this church, Brother Danny, the second I gave it all to God, when I really started trying to do right... That's when I had my trouble. That's good. That's where it's supposed to be. It's a fight. It's a battle. It's not a recreation room. We're in a battle for the Lord. You're supposed to have a fight when you try to live right. You have a love for the brethren. Love them, pray for them, and forgive them. Love them, pray for them, and forgive them. That's the way you treat your fellow church members. Number four. Number four. I'm going to tell you this. You know how you know you're saved? Because there's an inner conflict. There's a fight going on down here that you did not have before you got saved. Before you get saved, you're just one way, going one thing. You might do something wrong and feel bad about it, but you can go home and go to sleep that night. As soon as you get saved, you got something pulling one way and something else pulling the other way. It's a flesh and the spirit. And brother, if you ain't got that, you ain't a Christian. I'm telling you something tonight. I'm telling you, there's a war. Paul said in Romans chapter 7, if you want to read about it, it's a perfect example. He said, I war. There's a war going on inside of me. He said, the good that I want to do, I don't do. He said, I make up my mind I'm going to do something and I don't do it. I make up my mind I ain't going to do something and I wind up doing it. He said, I try to do right, but evil is present with me. Now, you and it makes perfect sense to you if you're a Christian. If you're not saved, you don't even understand that. A person's not saved, and what in the world, if I, if I want to do good, evil, he's crazy. But you, you're sitting there nodding your head. Yep, I know what you mean. You try to do good, bang, something will happen. Uh, you, you say, I ain't going to do that. You'll wind up doing it almost every time. You say, I'll never do this. You'll fall into that trap. Well, I'm going to read my Bible. I'm, I'm going to get up every morning. I'm going to read five. You do it about two mornings. You know? There's something in you pulling one way and something in you pulling the other way. You make up your mind you're going to be nice and you'll lose your temper and get mad that evening. You make up your mind you're going to pay your tithes and, and the devil will make something come up takes all your money. And, well, listen, there's a fight going on down in here. You know where the biggest fight in the world is? Right inside of us. Like the man said, we have found the enemy and they is us. Amen. Your biggest enemy is that fellow you shave every morning, boy. Man, that's, that's your biggest enemy right there. I like what old Ruckman said. He said he'd get up in the morning and he'd look in the mirror and say, all right, what are you up to today? <laughs> Amen. Uh, you know what? That old flesh, it's always pulling the other way. You make up your mind you're going to do right, and buddy, you watch it start squirming. You watch that flesh start resisting. It'll resist. Your flesh will resist. Try to, you don't believe it? Fast tomorrow. Fast tomorrow. And you watch that flesh. Give me something to eat. Give me something to eat. Shut up, the Spirit says. 
Shut up. You ain't getting nothing to eat. It ain't going to kill you. Yes, it is. I'm going to die. Throw me something down here. Shut up, stomach. You ain't getting nothing. We're fasting for the Lord. I know that. You know how I know that? Because I don't ever eat nothing until 1230 anyway. Hardly ever. One out of 100 days I eat breakfast. I like it. But if you eat, I eat breakfast, I just keep eating the whole rest of the day. Don't ever quit. Once I start, man, it's the rest of the day. So I don't eat until 1230. And when I eat 1230, something to one, uh, it don't bother me a bit. Tomorrow morning, I don't even think about food until 1230. Don't even enter my mind. But Wednesday, when I fast, at 10 o'clock, I'm, I'm starving. 10, man, I'd give anything for something to eat. I thought, well, I wasn't like this yesterday. You see, that war, that war is in your mind. Your mind starts to play tricks. As soon as you tell the flesh it can't have something, it'll start squirming. You know what that is? That's an inner war inside you. Tell your flesh no, and watch what happens. Just tell it no. Make your flesh. You think I want to get up this morning? I went to bed at 5.30 this morning and got up at 7.30. I wasn't even really asleep. I don't know if I even really went to sleep. You know, some, but now I went out this evening for about an hour and brother, I, I, I woke up this evening and I thought, where am I? Oh, it's Sunday. I got to go break. I was out at the table. <laughs> you know what? I, but you think I fell? I didn't want to. You, you start making this flesh do it and watch it squirm. You know what some people's problem is? They will not inconvenience their flesh and they won't tell their flesh no. And people who won't tell their flesh no wind up with rotten teeth and terrible health in jail and finally hell. You got to tell it no. It won't never do right if you don't make it. You have an inner conflict. You have a, in, a, 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 you have two dogs fighting inside you. The old man and the new man. You know which one's going to win? The one you feed the most. If you've got two dogs out here fighting, 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 and you feed this and starve that one, he's going to win. If you feed your flesh and give it what it wants, TV, music, bad music, drugs, alcohol, huh? your flesh is going to win and your spirit's going to lose. If you feed your spirit and on the Word of God right, and say no to the flesh, your spirit walk in the spirit and you won't fulfill the lust of the flesh. You understand that. People that's not saved can't even understand that. Walk in the spirit and you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. You say, what does that mean, preacher? Because my flesh won't go one way and your spirit won't go the other. Now, there are some people that try to give us the impression that they've arrived and their flesh, you know, they've conquered it and never... That's, that's, they're, they're just backslidden and don't know it. If you're trying to live right, the Apostle Paul said, and my flesh dwelleth no good thing, and my flesh pulls one way. He said, walk in the Spirit and not fulfill the lust of the flesh. You know how you know? You got an inner conflict. You walk out there in the world and you hear some old music and your flesh says, yeah, that sounds pretty good. And your spirit says, uh-uh, uh-uh. This ain't right. This dishonors the Lord. This dishonors the Lord, and you feel guilty. Why don't you get up and go to church? Preacher gets up and blesses you out like I did this morning, and your flesh says, No. Like Curly. No. I don't know how he does that. He did that last night. But your spirit says, Yeah. See? That conflict. You go out there in the world, do something in the world. Ball game, it lasts two hours. Yeah, man, I like it. Man, it went in overtime. Cool, we got our money's worth. Church lasts an hour. You think, when is this going to be up? So your flesh resents what's spiritual, but your spirit resents what's worldly. And it's just a fight. It's just a fight. You say, well, Brother Danny, what am I going to do? Just fight it till you die. You don't like that, do you? Paul said, I die daily. You've got to get up every morning and fight it till we leave this world. And it's going to be a fight. Well, the last thing I'm going to say tonight is there's an inner witness. There's a lot of people go around and say this. I've heard people, ever since I've been saved, and this ain't right, go up and say, Boy, I tell you, old so-and-so come in, and they shook hands. I said, praise God, I know they're saved. Man, because my spirit bears witness with their spirit. No, that ain't right. The Bible don't say nothing about my spirit bearing witness with your spirit. We may both have the wrong spirit. <laughs> it said, his spirit bears witness with our spirit. 
what the book says, that we are children of God. You can't say, well, I felt something when I shook his hand. I know he's... No, you may both be off. The Lord's Spirit bears witness with our spirit that we're Christians. Sometimes the Lord just... He's, I can't, I don't know how to say this, but he's just got ways of letting you know that you're his. Special little ways that nobody else can understand. Hadn't you had that happen to you before? Going down the road, get up, and the Lord just does some little something special just to let you know that he's there and that you belong. That, I tell you what that means, everything to me. It means everything to me when the Lord just does a little old something. And I don't even tell nobody sometimes. People don't even know it. But God just does just a little something. Maybe let a little something work out. A little answer to prayer. A little witness of the Spirit. Have you ever had a problem or something and turned on the radio and bang, just exactly what you need to hear. I'm telling you, there's an inner witness when you know you're saved. Let me ask you a question now. Are you saved? Are you sure you're saved? 